I, uh, I wanted to talk today about a lesson that I learned when I, I was watching my water bottle. I was watching my water bottle and something happened. And uh, it's related to changing the world. And uh, our, our mission as individuals and as a community to, to help change the world. So, uh, and also, I think you could say it ties into our readings this week because last week we were reading um, Acts 13 to 15 where Shaul and Barnaba were sent out from their home base in Antioch basically to change the world with the message of Messiah. And so they traveled through that, that region that is modern-day Turkey. They hit four big cities there, and they started, they gathered disciples around Yeshua and uh, connected them with each other. Remember last week we talked about how that's almost like a, could be pictured by a campfire when you get that tinder and you get those little, little sticks and you introduce the fire into their midst. And then it takes off from there. And uh, ideally it becomes a big toasty bonfire or sometimes it even becomes a raging forest fire. So we saw how they did that. Um, in this week's readings, Acts 16 to 18, uh, Shaul goes back through that area, checks up on those communities, and then he travels across, um, I think that maybe that's the Adriatic Sea, I'm not sure, I didn't look it up. But anyway, he travels across the, from the land region that is modern-day Turkey to the land region that is modern-day Greece. And he goes through Macedonia and Achaia, a couple of the main cities that were Philippi and Athens that were mentioned. And it's, it's very much the same thing. What I'm going to be talking about today is tied into what Paul was doing. Paul would go into an area and he would address people and their belief systems and talk to them where they were at and he would show them how some things that they believed didn't really line up with what they really believed. And then he would, he would introduce them to the message of Messiah. For instance, when he stood in the Areopagus, in that philosophical forum in the city of Athens, that's essentially what he did. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I have a, this, I'll start with this story about this water bottle. So Genevieve and I, uh, like I told you guys last week, we went on the 60-mile canoe trip for our five-year anniversary uh, down the South Saskatchewan River and uh, towards Saskatoon. And our first afternoon on the river, we pulled up the canoe on this big sandbar island in the middle of the river. And there was there were no clouds in sight, but there was a scorching south wind. It would be like the equivalent in, in Israel of a Hamsin. If any of you have been in Israel and you've encountered a Hamsin, it's like the scorching wind from the desert. And, and that's, what it, that's what it felt like. And so we pulled up on this island and uh, we had our lunch in this Hamsin, you could basically call it. Um, our sandwiches were turning more sandy than most sandwiches were. It's like, this is a real sandwich, just because the wind was constantly driving sand into everything. And while we were eating, I watched my Nalgene water bottle that I had just set up on the sand next to me. And it was remarkable. The wind was striking the water bottle, and it was slowly eroding the sand underneath the water bottle, grain by grain, until the water bottle would tip over in the direction of the wind. It was, it, was, it, was, it was almost like one of those things you wouldn't generally see in nature. You could imagine seeing the wind just strike the water, water bottle so hard, like a plow wind, that it would knock it over. But in this case, it undermined the grains of sand underneath the water bottle and it until it toppled in the direction of the wind. And, and I set my water bottle back up, and within a minute it had fallen over again, and I set my water bottle back up, and that time I watched really closely, and I could just watch those little granules of sand just ricocheting off of the water bottle and being undermined until it plopped over. It was, it was kind of fun, just on a, on a watching level. Uh, but, but I started thinking about that, and I, I, I had an insight about that that I, I want to share with you today. Um, I think basically what the wind was doing with my water bottle was what Paul was doing when he was speaking to those philosophers in the city of Athens. And it's what we are doing also as Yeshua's disciples in this city. When Paul went into, uh, into Athens, he, um, he established some connection points with them, some common understandings that they had, like that there is a creator and that we were made like him. And then he went on from there to draw some rational conclusions that undermined their idolatrous system that undermined the way they were worshipping and who they worshipped. And uh, you could almost say that Paul's message was like the wind that was eroding those, maybe you could say, ideological grains of sand under the water bottle of their idolatrous system so that it would collapse. And so that 
worship of the one true Elohim could be erected in its place. You can, can you kind of see the, the picture there? So I, I think when I was watching this happen with the, wi with the wind in my water bottle, I, I think I could see two like general principles there that are applicable if, if someone wants to change the world, if they want to change themselves. Uh, I think these are also principles that are applicable um, in the business world or um, in, if, you're, if you're interested in a social reformation, all of those areas. Uh, the first principle that I, I saw, I think you could call it um, foundational undermining. The wind was undermining the foundations that that water bottle was set up on until it toppled. So everybody say, foundational undermining. Foundational. I know that's kind of a big clunky term. I'm trying to think of a simple sticky term for that, for that principle, but I haven't been able to think of one. C can you guys think of any, any instances in, in your lives or in the world around us where, where the foundations of something are undermined until they collapse or topple? Oh, okay. So I in medieval times, you said sapping? is when they would dig underneath the wall until the wall toppled. Yes. Okay, and then they would gain access to the fortress or city, yes. by the means. Okay, excellent example. Um, and this, this is a broader principle. Like, for instance, if you drive your tires until they're totally bald, one day it's just going to blow. That's like undermining the tire until one day, boom, it's gone. Yeah, that's a great example. In communism in Russia or in China, um, they took the children in those countries and they didn't even bother training the, children, the, the, the parents so much in the ideals of communism. They more focused on the children because they knew that the children were the foundation of the country. And if they eroded those children's beliefs in their traditional um, systems, and if they indoctrinated them in the beliefs of communism, that those old systems would topple and communism would be a, a structure that stood. Yes, that's a great example. Yeah, that's true. And it's interesting too. You could say that like when a certain number of individuals um, become aberrant in their thinking and behavior, then eventually that's like undermining the foundation and eventually that country's legislation will collapse and be changed, eh? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I can't think of any stickier terms. We'll just call that maybe foundational undermining or I guess we could call it sapping, like you said, right? It's a word I've never heard before, so I, I like new words. Thank you for that, Levi. Okay, sapping. Um, the second principle I think I could see at play with the wind undermining my water bottle, and also it's a, uh, it, it's a principle that's at play in how we influence the people in our, our lives, for good or bad. Um, I think you could call it the the, the sudden gradual shift. We'll call it the sudden gradual shift. Okay? And, and what I mean by that is there was a shift taking place. The, the granules underneath my water bottle that were the foundation, they were gradually shifting. But then there was this certain tipping point where the water bottle suddenly radically changed its posture. So you, it, was like, it was like a shift that was both gradual and sudden. Can you see that? Um, there's, a, there's an author named Malcolm Gladwell, and he actually wrote a book recently called The Tipping Point. And he, he, he included a lot of interesting examples um, in, um, in, the, in the world of law enforcement in New York, uh, in the world of marketing, in the world of uh, fashion, where, uh, where there's this, there are these forces at work, and often they're behind the scenes, they're uh, kind of um, under the radar, and then all of a sudden in one day, it goes big, it goes viral, and that's the concept of the tipping point. So you could totally see the concept of the tipping point with my water bottle, right? And I would call that like the sudden gradual shift. Oh, really? Your dad worked under, underground in the gold mine, and they would drill and drill and drill, and suddenly the whole area would cave in. Great example, absolutely, yeah. So I, uh, I have some examples of that to, uh, we, can, uh, we can look at. Oh, actually, before we do that, I think this is a spiritual principle also, though. Like, I'm, I'm using all of these examples in the natural world and in the world around us, but I do think it's a, I think it's a spiritual principle that, that is very relevant for, for us as a community in accomplishing our mission. I'll, I'll give you two scriptures for that. Um, in the book of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, chapter 1, he's given a mission from Elohim. Elohim appears to him, and he, he sends him to speak his words. And Yirmiyahu says, I'm too young. He says, no, you're not. You're going to go where I want you to go, and you're going to say what I want you to say. And this is what he says in the book of Yirmiyahu, chapter 1, verse 10. He says, look, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to, let's count them, pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. He used six verbs there. The first four were destructive, 
and the, the last two were constructive. So I'm just going to read those again. You should just listen for that. Did you notice the sequence there? I've appointed you what, first of all, to pluck up. That's like if there's a, a, a plant in the ground, you pull the plant out of the ground so that its root systems are removed and the whole thing is exposed. Oh, and to break down. Uh, you could imagine a wall or a building being demolished by a bulldozer. It was, like, it was like the Almighty telling Jeremiah, you are going to be my bulldozer and you're going to be taking out some structures for me to destroy. That's pretty, that's pretty utter. That's basically removing something from existence and to overthrow. What's that concept of? Turning something upside down. So you can hear Jeremiah had this authorization to mess stuff up. And then finally, what was the last two? To build and to plant. So you can hear that often before a new structure is going to be built, you have to demolish the old one. The bulldozer has to come in before the trades can come in and they can dig a new foundation and put up a new structure. Eh? And then again, if you have a certain plot of ground and you have trees there that you don't want, out with the old trees before you have in with the new. Right. So anyway, that's one scripture that under, underscores that concept. And then the other one is um, where Yeshua in Luke chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 5 uh, say the same things. And he said, woe to you who are full because you're going to be hungry. But if you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you're so blessed. Happy are you because you're going to be filled. It's that concept that we're like, each of us is like a Tupperware container. Each of us is like a vessel. And we're, we're this empty container and we're going to be filled with something. And if you're filled with trash or with, uh, with false material, that has to be removed before you can be refilled with the true, before you can be filled with the good stuff. Eh? So can you kind of hear that idea? If you, uh, so if you have, um, let's say if you have a water bottle erected and you need to get that out of the way before you can, let's say, put a, replace it with a new one because the old one is full of, full of toxicity and poison, then you, uh, you get it out of the way. You knock it down uh, before you can uh, maybe replace it. You can kind of hear the idea there, hey? It's kind of the concept of like out with the old before in with the new. Um, and this, I think I can totally see this being a principle that's applicable like for us as individuals, um, for communities of people, for whole cities uh, and nations. Uh, this is true for businesses. Uh, this is true for, like, for social movements. Um, I, have, I, have some, I have some examples in mind and maybe we can brainstorm together and just, just think of some of these and see how these two principles of foundational undermining and, and the sudden gradual shift uh, play in together. Um, Two, two I can think of on an individual level is very often there's a certain point where a leader, and maybe it's a political leader or a religious leader, will, um, will be exposed by the media for some kind of corruption or sin. Though something big will go public. And the question is, did that happen overnight? Or was that a slow shift that all of a sudden became sudden? That would be one example I could think of on an individual level with temptation. People give in to temptation a little bit and, the, and gradually their, um, their character, their value systems, etc., and, and the way they, they think, it, it's undermined. And it's little by little by little until one day all of a sudden there's a massive collapse and it goes public. That would be an example of foundational undermining and a sudden gradual shift. Eh? Um, and I, one that I can think of in my personal life and this, is, this, is, this relates to some degree, but you know, the, we, we've been doing community for almost three years now. And you know, we've, we've also uh, been doing community in a kind of a synagogue fashion um, in, in Saskatoon. And, and I hit a certain point in the way we were doing community where I said, you know, this is really good. Like we're having very beautiful times and it's very meaningful to me, but I don't feel like we're reaching our city the way we could or maybe the way we should. I don't feel like maybe this is the best way to disciple people. And, uh, and for me, like, there was just, there was, it was like this, this, um, this gradual shift. It was like this foundational undermining where, you know, we would gather on Shabbats and it would be wonderful, but we weren't seeing a lot of new people. And we weren't seeing people that were around sometimes change the way I would hope. And so for me, that was like a foundational undermining where I began to say, could it be that we could be doing something more or something differently? And then, you know, in the last year, you could say maybe I had a collapse in my value systems or the way that I would do uh, congregation, which is why we're now doing this kind of 
this two-sided thing, right? Where we're still having like our kind of big synagogue gatherings, but we're also doing small group stuff. We're doing things in the homes, etc. So that would be an example from my life, eh? Um, I don't know, can you guys think of any other examples about how those two principles play out in individuals' lives? Or maybe you've even seen it in your own life? Maybe when uh, Genevieve was, I was courting Genevieve and eventually she just fell for me when I proposed and she said yes. That was a gradual sudden shift, eh? <laughs> how about, that's on an individual level. What about on a social level? let's say, with how societies operate and uh, the way they relate to each other and to outsiders. Um, I can think of a couple examples where you can see this foundational undermining. Uh, there was a time when the, the, the gladiatorial arts were very popular in the Roman Empire. They would, they would get a couple guys in the stadium, give them some weapons, or give one guy weapons and not the other guy, and then they would, they would pit them against each other in a fight to the death. Like, very barbaric, right? There was a point, though, where, like, the gladiatorial arts fell out of popularity. There was a point when they were outlawed, I believe it was in the 300s. Did that happen overnight? No. When, how did that happen? It happened because more and more people saw that it was wrong. That it was wrong to force people to fight each other to the death. That it was a violation of, maybe you could say, human rights. Uh, there was one, there's one particular case in that history where there was a monk who was committed to nonviolence and uh, he, he appealed to the crowds in the stadium to, uh, to lay off, to turn away from, from that kind of sport, and, uh, and they killed him. And it just, for some reason, it sickened the whole crowd. Like, you could hear a pin drop, and everyone just began leaving the stadium. And I think it was after that that, that they were actually outlawed in the Roman Empire. So that would be an example where slowly, slowly, people's opinions changed. You could almost say it was like the, the gladiatorial sports were like this edifice, this building that was erected. And, 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 and individual opinion, one by one, was changing. It, the foundations were being eroded until it collapsed all of a sudden. Um, that would be an example. Uh, another one I couldn't think of was slavery. Slavery, as an industry, did not collapse in a day. How did it begin? It began with a small handful of people that were passionate about people that were being mistreated as slaves, that were, being, that were being kidnapped and sold into the slave industry, and they wouldn't shut up and they wouldn't stop acting about it. And, and, and they, began spreading, they began spreading their message and it caught on. And it's another example of, a, of a, like a, you could say, a social reform movement that was grassroots that began from the bottom up. It was like those individual granules of sand being eroded until finally the, the, whole, the whole edifice of human trafficking, legalized human trafficking, collapsed. Um, that would be another example. I don't know, can you guys think of any other ones in, in, in terms of social movements and reform? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, absolutely, abortion. I was going to talk about that kind of at the end when we talk about some practical things, but yeah, we, why, why don't we talk about that for a minute right now? You know, to a degree, I think that's happening. Like, the, there's this uh, attempt at undermining the... Um, the ideological foundations that abortion is built on and the value system it's built on. But to another degree, I don't know if that's happening. Uh, very often people think we are going to solve this problem of abortion, of this violation of defenseless human beings being murdered on a legislative level. If we can just somehow get the right act and just ram it through parliament. If we can just get that legislation and maybe even with maybe a, maybe seemingly, um, seemingly um, innocent legislation but with a Trojan horse in it, that kind of concept, then we can, we can um, stop abortion in a day. I don't know if that's going to happen, quite honestly. If, if you look at that principle, um, when, when you live in a democracy, the decisions in a democratic government reflect the opinions of the majority. So if you have a majority of people that want abortion, you're probably going to have abortion, generally speaking. So I, I wonder if the solution wouldn't be to begin changing individual minds. What if every follower of Yeshua in our country engaged a couple people, just one or two people, and began to influence those people against abortion? Just on a one-on-one -on -one level, right? I'm not talking about big campaigns on TV or in the media. I'm not talking about legislative campaigns even. No, I'm not against those things, right? 
But, but, but too often, I, I, in the evangelical world, I see people that are against abortion, and so they go the route of like the, like trying to solve this thing politically or through le this legislative system or through uh, decisions in courts, and they try and solve this thing through mass media campaigns, and they pour a lot of money and a lot of effort into it. And I'm not saying I'm against that, but often those people don't spend any time doing one-on-one -on -one stuff with the people on their block or in their neighborhood or with coworkers. There are, maybe there's a girl on their block that lives a couple doors down who just got pregnant. But because those people are so obsessed with the big picture out there and fighting, maybe they don't have any time or they don't spend any time building bridges with their own neighbors. But the idea of, of those granules of sand being eroded is like working with individuals, eh? So I don't know, that, that's my personal take on that, on that issue. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I think we need to be focusing on individuals because that's what's going to change the country. Hi, baby. You want to sit with me for a minute? Okay. Yeah. Only if you're really quiet, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how about, I don't know how, how, how well-read you all are, are, are all on the business world. Maybe Mike and Shoshana are more than some of us. But ha have you ever seen those principles at work in, in, in the corporate world or with, with individual businesses? It's kind of the, the foundational undermining and sudden gradual shifts. Taxes? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can see, I, I think you could see with corporations, though, that often corporations get so large, like they, they slowly degenerate, they slowly rot from the inside out, and they lose their values, and they're often just out to kind of preserve the majority, and everyone wants to keep their job, and eventually, you know, you begin to lose, you begin to lose your value, and eventually it's just going to, in a day it can go belly up, but it took years to get to that point. How about on a national or political level? Can you, can, you, can you think of some examples on a national political level where you see foundational undermining and uh, like that sudden gradual shift? A couple I thought of were um, the collapse of the Roman Empire. Do you know who was responsible for the collapse of Imperial Rome's power? The Romans. The Romans. Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Yeah, yeah Rom Romans lost faith in their own system to some degree. A lot of them... Uh, got really lazy and began just living off welfare and living for entertainment, bread and taxes, and, and uh, assigning all of the, the work that the Roman Empire needed to, to grow to slave labor. It's not going to keep you going for too long. I think another person that was responsible for the, the collapse, or you could say the flip of the Roman Empire, was, a, was an itinerant rabbi who never wrote a book or uh, did anything too, too impressive on a political level named Yeshua. He started this grassroots movement and uh, before you know it, that belief in this man as the true king spread all through the Roman Empire like wildfire. And it began eroding the foundations of the Roman Empire, which was faith in Caesar as God, as the ultimate authority. More and more people began paying, you know, they continued to pay their taxes and they continued to, uh, to, to obey the authority of Caesar to the degree that it, he didn't conflict with the authority of the true king Yeshua. But scholars estimate by the, by the time that Constantine came on the scene in the early 300s, like, there was a pretty decent percentage of the Roman population that was believing in Yeshua, despite like 10 major thrusts to wipe out that movement. So that would be, that would be an example. Um, by the time Constantine came on the scene, there had been three centuries of this foundational undermining of this, um, you, could say, you could see this gradual shift until all of a sudden with Constantine, it just flipped. And he, you know, maybe it was just, um, just appearances, but he, it looks like he went over to the other side, so to speak. So you can see that in the Roman Empire. You can also see that in the reborn Roman Catholic Empire. Uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic Empire had a very firm grip on Europe in the, in the shall we say, Dark Ages. What happened? How, how, did, uh, how did the world go from that to where we are today, to uh, the, the human freedoms that we have now? It was because there were some individuals in the 13 and 1400s that were convinced that people had the right to read the word of Elohim, God, for themselves. And so they began translating it. They began disseminating it. They began speaking out. And slowly, people's minds began changing. It wasn't overnight. One by one by one by one. Until you just hit the, the Catholic Empire hit this point where it lost its grip on whole nations. So you can definitely see that same uh, element at work there.
And then we already mentioned communism. Communism would be another example. Communism in Russia didn't collapse overnight. It collapsed because there was this gradual change, right, that finally hit the upper echelons of, uh, of um, Russian government. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are some examples that I can think of, you know, from individuals, from social movements, from, uh, from national political entities, and, uh, and um, yeah, and from business also. Um, maybe we could just, just, just to finish this talk, like we kind of looked at some examples, we looked at how these principles work, and they are very scriptural. Like, how, how does that look like for us? Like, each of us as individuals, you know, Yeshua has called us to, uh, to be a disciple, to follow him in his way, uh, to do his Torah, his teaching, and, uh, and to make more disciples for him, to influence the world around us for him. And that is, doesn't just apply on an individual level, it also applies to us as a community, hey? Eh? So let's say we have people in our lives, and we would love to see those people see Yeshua for who he is and start following him too. Maybe some of those people already have a structure built in their lives, or maybe they're already full. Is it one of those things where you do the frontal attack and you attack their belief system, or you just say, your value system is all messed up and this is why, and you see the whole thing collapse and you see them change overnight? Maybe sometimes. That would be, that's, that would be great. But I think more often than not, it may be one of those things where if we want to like reach people for Yeshua, you just engage with them and little by little, through conversations, through glimpses that they catch of your life and your beliefs, you begin to undermine the foundations of their value system, of what they believe in, why they don't believe in God, why they would never go to uh, a faith community or whatever. And there might be a day, and it might be a year, it might be 10 years from now, when their belief systems, they'll realize this is inconsistent, this isn't true, and it will collapse in their minds. And they'll be open for the truth to come in. They'll be open to be filled with faith in Messiah. Can you, can you see that principle at work? And I mean, it, it would be, it's, it's tough because that requires actually engaging with people on a regular basis over the long term, which is hard in our society, right? We just want to go door to door, walk up to the door, have someone fall on their knees and turn to God. You know, we just want to give them a track and see their lives change overnight. And sometimes that does happen and that's fantastic. But more often than not, maybe it takes that gradual undermining. That, that sudden gradual shift, you could say. Yeah, excellent. You know, and the example I just used was reaching non-religious people with, with the message of Messiah, with the gospel, right? What about the people in the city that are already believers in Yeshua, but maybe they, they don't see the relevance of Torah to their lives. They, they don't understand how it works from Ephesians 2, that they've been brought near to the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise and all this stuff. What does that look like? Is it one of those things where someone um, that just grew up in a traditional church is overnight going to start call, calling Jesus Yeshua or um, celebrating the festivals? Or could it be that, again, it requires like long-term commitment, doing life with people that are not like us, trying to find those opportunities to engage with the broader body of Messiah? And slowly over time, people have those antinomian foundations, those like anti-Torah um, underpinnings, they begin to be eroded as they see the beauty of a Torah lifestyle, as they see the joy of celebrating the festivals, as they see that it's actually a thing of freedom and not a thing of bondage like they always heard. As they begin to catch glimpses of the Jewish Jesus that we follow. Can, can, can you see that? So again, it's, 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 maybe it won't happen overnight. It's one of those gradual things that all of a sudden, overnight, you will see a sudden shift though, uh, long term. That, that, that's my belief. Um, Hopefully that's encouraging for us. You know, we're just where the rubber meets the road that we'll be saying, Father, who are the people in my life that you want me to spend time with um, and, that th and, and through me that you want to influence long term? Finding those people and, and making those sacrifices to and invest in, in those relationships. I think that's where it starts. And, we're, and when every one of us in the body of Messiah does that, we are going to be a very powerful force for changing the world for the good. And that's what we want. That's what Paul and uh, Barnaba uh, were sent out to do and uh, what we're sent out to do. I uh, want to finish this, um, this talk by reading a couple of pages to you from a book called uh, Back to Jerusalem. How many of you guys have heard of the Back to Jerusalem movement in China? It's huge. The Back to Jerusalem movement is going, I, I believe it's going to change the eastern half of the world more than anything else has in the last 500 years. I, I sincerely believe that. Because right now, one out of every t ten, out of ten Chinese people are believers in Yeshua. 
How many people is that? Like roughly, you could say a hundred million people. And there are a hundred people, million people in China that have this vision called the, the Back to Jerusalem vision. And basically, their vision is to prepare to take the message of Messiah through the countries along the ancient Silk Road highways all the way back to Israel where the gospel started. So the gospel started in Israel. It went out to the nations all the way to China, which is the ends of the world, if you want to look at it from Israel's point of view. And they want to take it back. Now, there are a couple of challenges involved in this vision. Number one, you're not legally allowed to leave China. Uh, number two, the strongholds of Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism are all located in this block of territory that these Chinese believers want to plow through on the way back to Israel. But this is like, this is a vision that Chinese believers like, they talk about. Uh, Chinese house church leaders obsess about. It's what they eat for breakfast. It's what they pray for every day. And they are, they are practically preparing for it also. Uh, they're learning the languages of the countries between China and Israel. And uh, they're learning how to relate the gospel to these different religious worldviews. Very powerful stuff. Um, I, I, I could tell you a lot about it right now, but that'll give you a basic idea. Anyway, this is a simple book called Back to Jerusalem uh, with Paul Hathaway. And uh, they, uh, there are a couple of the Chinese house church leaders that talk about this, this vision that they're, they're living for and that they're willing to die for. And there's a little section in here called An Army of Worms. It's one of their strategies on page 90. And I, I want to read it to you. It's about four pages long, but I, I, think, you can, I think you can see how this concept of, the, the, um, of um, foundational undermining on like a granular level on, on a microscopic little level. And the, the concept of the sudden gradual shift, it definitely applies here. Uh, I'll just, I'll read this to you. And if you, if you have a thought, put up your hand and I'll pause. And if I have a thought, I'll interject with that also. Uh, the Back to Jerusalem movement and the fulfillment of the Great Commission face powerful adversaries. Islam holds more than a billion souls in captivity and blindness. Buddhism and Hinduism have been established for more than 2,000 years. The devil feels safe in these strongholds that have largely gone, on, gone unchallenged throughout Christian history. When faithful believers start taking flames of fire from God's altar into these dark regions, and those fires start spreading to others and the light increases, Satan will be furious. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Revelation 12, 12. Satan will not surrender without a bloody fight. But when the devil fights against God's children, he's fighting against God himself. And our Lord's weakness is much stronger than the devil's strength. Nevertheless, we expect that much blood will be spilled. One of the most powerful ways we can overcome the spiritual giants of Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism is by witnessing with our own blood and laying down our lives. For each Christian that the devil tries to kill, the light of the gospel will shine a little brighter and his hold on the people will loosen little by little. Here's where it gets good. It will not be an army of elephants that marches into nations like Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and Iran with the gospel, trampling down the strongholds. Sometimes it seems as if a lot of mission effort consists of elephant plans, huge and grandiose strategies for overwhelming the devil's strongholds and making him surrender his captives. But it is easy for border guards to detect an elephant entering the country. It makes a lot of noise and is impossible to hide. Elephants are easy to catch because they move slowly and are so visible. This seems to be how much mission work is conducted today. Please understand we're talking in generalities here, for we know many of the Lord's people from all around the world have faithfully been laboring in these difficult nations for years. God bless them. Instead of an army of elephants, we believe God wants to send an army of insects and crawling creatures to cause the collapse of the house of Buddha, the house of Hinduism, and the house of Mohammed. The Chinese church is not strong in human terms. We don't have a lot of money or any grandiose plans, but we are an army of little ants, worms, and termites who know how to work underground, because that is how we have learned to work in China for decades. The Word of God tells us how we should fight the spiritual fight and offers great encouragement to little creatures like us. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp, with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them, the wind will pick them up, and a gale will blow them away. Isaiah 41, 14 to 16. While an elephant cannot advance into sensitive areas, little worms and ants can go anywhere. They can go into temples, mosques, and even into king's palaces. 
Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. How's that for a fantastic application of that passage, hey? This is how the Chinese Christians will operate during the Back to Jerusalem mission. We will not make much noise, but will secretly and quietly do the Lord's work underground. We will be quite difficult to detect. You may not hear many victorious reports of church growth coming back from the Middle East or Southeast Asia, but be assured that our ants, worms, and termites are already there, quietly working away, slowly loosening the foundations of Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. You will not see any great or small church buildings resulting from our efforts because we are determined to do what the Lord has led us to do in China these past 50 years and establish spiritual fellowships of believers who meet in their homes. We won't build a single church building anywhere, but the Lord will be building up his church of living stones with Jesus as the cornerstone. Termites are very hard to detect. They do their destructive work inside the walls of homes and underneath the floorboards. Usually, the owner of the house has no clue that his magnificent structure is being eaten away until it is too late and it collapses in a heap. The termite can do what even an elephant is unable to do. There are many biblical examples of little creatures causing great havoc in the houses of the mighty. The proud and arrogant Pharaoh refused to let God's people go, so to encourage him to reconsider, the Lord did not send a mighty army of angels, but a series of plagues, including frogs, gnats, and flies. Moses told Pharaoh what God would do. I will plague your whole country with frogs. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. I'm sure their wives love that part. The frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. Exodus 8, 2-4. Pharaoh saw no reason to be concerned about his oppressed Israelite slaves, and he showed no respect for God. But when these small creatures pestered him in his palace bedroom, he took note. Sometimes it is not large initiatives that are the most effective, but the unified efforts of many small pests. In the second chapter of the book of Joel, we have a vivid description of an army of locusts that the Lord refers to as, quote, my great army that I send among you. Although Joel refers to the invading Babylonian army of the time, the characteristics of that army are worth emulating. Good on them for like referencing the actual context of that passage. Let's look at why this army of locusts was so effective. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses. Like thieves, they enter through the windows. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his commands. Joel 2, 6-9 and 11. Ants and termites have a spirit of teamwork. They are so small that they realize they can achieve nothing by themselves, so they work together to achieve their goals. Quote, they advance together in ranks. By the time the leaders of these nations realize that an invading army of ants and worms has slipped into their midst, it will be too late to drive them out. Herod was a king with little regard for God or the people of God. Like the nations of the world, he was proud, pompous, and arrogant, fearing neither God nor man. He was a law unto himself, thinking his authority was final, his reign impregnable. Surely, this is how many of the Muslim, Buddhist, and Hindu nations feel today. So true. They are sure that they have the truth, and are so entrenched in their traditions that they are quick to persecute any traces of Christianity, and extinguish the slightest sign of spiritual light that the Lord graciously sends their way. How foolish they are! They do not know that Jesus Christ has all power and authority in both heaven and earth. They think they're completely safe, not realizing that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will destroy them with the breath of his mouth. As the prophet Isaiah declared, the government will be on his shoulders. Think of what happened to Herod. One day Herod, quote, wearing his royal robes, sat down on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Herod must have felt that things were going great for him at that moment. He had succeeded in making a name for himself, and now the people were shouting his praises. But what Herod didn't realize was that his authority had only been loaned to him by God, and God was about to take it away. Quote, Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. 
but the word of God continued to increase and spread. Herod was dead, but the word of God continued its glorious course, changing the hearts and minds of men and women, boys and girls from every nation, tribe and language. Nothing can ever defeat the advance of God's word. As Isaiah says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The psalmist makes the same point. Your word, O Lord, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens, and so does Jesus. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. As our missionaries take the banner of the Lord into the dark nations, you will probably hear nothing of it. In fact, we are hoping that you won't specifically know what we're doing. For if you do hear about our activities, that means the governments in those lands who seek to keep Christianity beyond their borders will also know what we're doing. It's better if they find out that Jesus has come and taken over their house once it's too late to do anything about it. By God's grace, we will be like little worms, ants, and termites, quietly but consistently working away, loosening the foundations of the houses of Buddha, Hinduism, and Muhammad until they collapse. So that, that was, if you could imagine just sitting down for coffee with three of like the, the foremost leaders in the Yeshua movement in China, uh, their names are Brother Yun, Peter Shu Yangzi, and Enoch Wang. You're like talking about men who have spent decades and decades of, in prison, many of whom have almost been killed for their faith. Uh, men who are leading movements, like some of these guys have hundreds of thousands and even millions of people in their movements. If you can imagine sitting down for coffee with three of those men, and just having them tell you about the vision that Yeshua has given them to take the gospel through those nations back to Israel, you just had that coffee conversation, you could say. It's like you just, you just heard it for yourself. And, and it's exciting. It's just exciting that Yeshua is moving around the world, that he is giving people a vision, and that some of those ancient strongholds are going to get totally broadsided. Like they are going to have no idea where that came from or what hit them. And you know that strategy that Yeshua gave those Chinese believers, I believe it also applies here. Because there are strongholds, there are mental strongholds, there are value systems that are false, there is idolatry that happens in our culture too. And maybe it isn't so in your face, religious, like Hinduism or Muslim or Buddhism, but um, materialism is just as religious. Uh, atheism is just as religious. There are a lot of things like that, right? So anyway, we have, we have a job here too, and uh, maybe we get to be pests for Messiah also. We get to be like his army of ants or, or termites or worms that undermines the foundations that some of the negative things in our society are built on so we can see them collapse and so we can see Yeshua's kingdom uh, built in, in our city and in our country. Who's the author? Uh, the, the book is called Back to Jerusalem um, with three Chinese house church leaders um, and the, the English author is Paul Hathaway. Hat Away. Yeah. There's a related book uh, called uh, The Heavenly Man. It's the story of Brother Yun, one of these men. Uh, just on a little side note, um, when we were producing like Hebrew Quest, the 40 Hebrew lessons, we packed those lessons restoration, right? Like I put in so many pro Torah plugs and, and all of that, right? And I, and I made a lot of practical applications. And what, like part of my heart for where I hope Hebrew Quest eventually goes is into China. Because there are these Chinese believers with this mission to go through these countries and to make it back to Jerusalem. But what are they going to do when they make it back to Jerusalem? Wouldn't it be nice if they had a basic concept of Torah, if they understood some of the basics of the Hebrew language, so that they could like floor Jewish people by communicating the good news of Yeshua like on a Jewish level and in Hebrew? Wouldn't that be awesome? That's my dream. And actually, I'll share something really cool with you guys. Like, uh, on our holylanguage.com website, I have like a Google Analytics thing installed where it tells me where our web traffic is coming from and which languages mo spend the most time on our site. Guess what the number one language on our site is? English. English, that's right. Guess what the number two language on our site is right now? Chinese. Chinese. So after English speakers, we have more Chinese speakers working through Hebrew Quest and learning Hebrew from us than anybody else. It's one of those things where it's like you're the sower and you're just throwing your seeds out there. And they're going into China and you'll probably never see where they go. But, yeah, but hopefully those Chinese believers that are studying Hebrew with us or online will make it back through those countries and they'll make it back to Israel and they'll be able to communicate powerfully the good news about Yeshua in a way that maybe we never will or we never could. I, I love that, Genevieve. I'm, I'm part of the Back to Jerusalem movement too. I'm, I, I'm part of that. I like that. Count me in. Thank you for joining us in this message. 
I pray that it's been an inspiration to you in your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.